Warning. This work of fiction, intended for adults, contains strong language and graphic depictions of violence. Discretion advised. The Ballad of the Flower, Book One, Druid. Written and performed by Neil Linson Meyer. Chapter 21. Terra hated being a lizard. North Brimia had very few reptiles excluding bog, and the snakes and skinks of her woods were so green that they would be easy to spot in the sands around Fort Branset. She got the idea at breakfast, where they had been served roasted lizards that were covered in spikes and barbs and a strange spice that made her stomach hurt. Thankfully, her scales were protecting her from the heat of the sand, and once she got over the urge to burrow into the ground and keep herself hidden, she managed to skitter around outside the walls. It was keeping the seeds in her mouth that was the difficult and uncomfortable part. She always kept seeds on her, or happened to find some in her hair no matter where she went. She put memories of her hair out of her mind as she crept into a shadow made by the fort wall. She was looking for a particularly weak or degraded point in the stone, something that the roots of her plants could dig into and destroy. With a few minutes of dedicated searching, she found a large crack, large for a lizard at least, and with a flick of her tongue she stuck a small, round seed into it. She turned and waved her tail, trying to cover the indent with sand, but it probably wouldn't be noticed. She ended up circling the entire fort a few times and found places that were susceptible to her machinations. She snuck back into the fort and found Barney reading his little red book. There was a whooshing sound as Terra shifted back into her human form and a minute or so where she had to stop herself from sticking out her tongue. The seeds are planted, Terra said, thinking about how something so literal could sound so mysterious. Any luck with the map? Barney was hardly paying attention. I genuinely think this is a treasure map, Barney said, his eyes focused on the page. Are we searching for buried treasure next? Terra sat on the bunk next to him, looking at the pages. Look here, Barney pointed to a landmass. This looks a lot like how the Great Plains used to be mapped, before we developed better cartographic techniques. Terra saw a large blob, with more definition at the edges than in the middle, covered in red marks and crosses. These circles are referred to as treasures or... Wealth, it's a very old word, Barney said, pointing out a few of the little dots on the page. Why are they all crossed out? Terra asked, looking over the map. Well, those markings are much newer than the actual text. You can tell by the fading definition in the characters. Hmm, Terra agreed, completely oblivious to what Barney was talking about. And they aren't all crossed out. Barney indicated a single red circle near the western edge of the plains. This one may still be there. Barney took out one of his own maps and added the marking to his section of the plains. And I think it might be a very productive field trip, he said. What exactly would we find there? Tara asked, holding out her hand for Barney to give her the book. He gently placed it in her hands, like a very expensive vase. The Rikens are only really concerned with tracking gold and weapons. I suppose there would be a lot of those. Although, Barney pointed to a few characters on the margins of the page, it reads more like an archaeological expedition than a treasure hunt. He put a thin finger to his chin and gave a sound of deep thought. There was a commotion in the street outside, and Tara thought something had gone wrong with the scouting mission, but when she went to look, she saw it was just a large wagon with mail and goods for the town. Tara watched little children swarm the dragonborn cart driver, asking for packages and for news and for toys. One dragonborn, in the uniform of the Riken military, came to the back of the wagon. Tara watched him shake hands with one of the cart drivers and take a chest of mail from the covered section. It was small and locked, and it made Tara feel queasy. The guard moved into the fort proper, and Tara lost sight of him. She went back inside the hostel. Barney, I think some intel just got dropped off, she said to him. He seemed a bit upset at how often she was interrupting his thinking. We need more time for a safe extraction. Let's wait for the others, Barney said. I think we need to go now, Tara said. Her stomach was churning with every passing second that she didn't know. What if we can take it before anyone reads it? We're not even here for intel, Tara. I'm sure it's not a time-sensitive matter. Barney was trying very hard not to look up from his book. As long as we get it back to headquarters, I'm sure everything will be fine. Tara couldn't stop pacing. She had spent the morning doing her job, and it was noon now. She felt like the heat was starting to get to her. When the others returned, she told them about the chest. Well, if we really need to, we can go on tonight, Adam said. The guard changes at sundown. 
We'd be taking some unnecessary risks. I'd rather try and get in when it's darker, Carson said. Seconded, Siri said, looking at Tara with a sorry face. We don't have weapons, so our only chance at success is things going perfectly. Tara felt a bit betrayed, but everything they were saying made a lot of sense. How are our entry points? Carson asked her directly. All clear, boss. I can get us in. Tara sounded glum to herself. Siri put a hand on her shoulder and squeezed it. Everybody rest up, Carson said. We're going in late and heading out into the desert. Tara laid in bed with her eyes on the dirty ceiling of the hostel. She tried to meditate a few times, but her mind was too busy to settle. She ended up pacing and checking their supplies and pacing again. She couldn't even call Bog since she needed all of her spells for the mission tonight. She hoped he was doing well in the cold. She thought about how bad his arthritis got when it snowed, no matter how strongly she mixed the potions for him. She sat down next to Siri's bed and traced little patterns on her hand until she woke up. Mm, what's going on, little priest? Siri was a little groggy, and Tara kissed her hand to apologize. I really do think you have a nice butt, Tara said. Siri smiled and stretched. Can't sleep? Siri asked her, pulling up an arm to rest her head on. I'm worried about Bog. Tara said. If she was worried about the mission, she would make everyone worry. I miss him. It was true enough. Isn't Bog, like, the most powerful person you know? Siri was still yawning. Well, yeah, but he gets cold, Tara said a bit shyly, still holding on to Siri's free hand. Are you worried about him getting cold, or are you worried about bringing me home to meet him? Siri said casually. Tara hadn't considered that prospect, but her anxious mind was quickly devouring it. Don't worry, I make great first impressions, Siri said, rolling onto her back. I think you might not even fit in the tree, Tara said. She wasn't sure if she had meant to say it out loud. Well, it'll be better than you meeting my family, Siri sat up. Hey, Dad, you know how you never wanted to see me again? This is my druid girlfriend. Tara smiled a bit, and Siri played with some of her hair. Do you want to see your family again? Tara asked. Fuck em, Siri said casually. I've got the four of you now, you know? She wove the messy black hair through her fingers. Does that make Carson our dad? Tara asked. He's pretty fatherly, I think. I feel bad for his kids, though. Can you imagine? Tara, why did you only get a 98% on your history test? Father, I was devising new plans to expand the empire and bring law to the lawless. This is acceptable. Tara giggled and kissed Siri gently. Why don't you come get some rest? Siri patted the tiny space left on her mattress. No, I'm going to check our supplies again. Sleep tight. Tara kissed Siri's cheek. I'm not going to let anything hurt you, little priest. In a few seconds, Siri was snoring again. Sundown came and went, and Tara felt like she was going to explode if something didn't happen soon. Finally, after she had checked their supplies for a seventh time, Carson gave the word. They quietly moved past the other residents in the sleeping quarters, paid their silver pieces for the day, and set out into the cold. There was one last stop at the fountain to fill up their skins, and they stepped out from the main gate into the clear night. The moons were both showing, the larger full, the smaller a crescent. There was enough light to see, and enough darkness to hide. They made it over a dune and set down their supplies in the sand. They would make their way back to this spot before carrying on back to the islands, then they would teleport back to headquarters. It was oddly invigorating, staying in the shadows of dunes as they circled the high walls towards their entry points. There were some close calls with the guards on the wall, but no alarms were sounded. They reached the first entry point near the back of the fort proper. Adam watched the guards move and signaled them all to approach the wall one at a time. When they were all there, pressed flat against the sandstone, Tara set her hand on the ground, focusing on the seed there. Growing the root system was simple, but it was a bit trickier to be precise hollowing out some of the wall while leaving the rest structurally stable. She left an archway for them to duck through, and Adam moved into the compound first. He checked the corners of the entryway and pulled them all into a small storage room. They were in a hallway away from the kitchen, and so far, unseen. The creaking door sounded like a siren to Tara, and Adam had to stop them all, listening for any changes in the steady pacing footsteps above them. Barney pointed around a corner and Adam led them all past an old wooden door that had been worn down hard by years of use. They were inside the kitchen. It was noisy in here. Tara heard several lizards still moving around in separate cages, climbing over each other and licking the air. 
She pulled a seed from her pouch, the only thing she had with her, and teased it into a bit of a vine. Siri boosted her up to the ceiling, and after Barney indicated the exact spot with a bit of light from his wand, she set the vine loose in the stone floor above them. There was a tense, silent thirty seconds, where nothing happened. The floor was thick, and Tara had to move slowly to keep any large chunks from falling and making noise. Dust kept hitting her face, but she held her focus, steadily wearing away the one thing keeping her from that secret chest she was sure of it. There was a soft sound as the ceiling above her finally crumbled away. Siri set Tara down in a small pile of loose sand, and casually tossed Adam up to the next floor. He was quiet for a moment, and Tara had a terrible feeling of fear when he was out of her sight. He leaned over the hole with the mail chest and dropped it to Carson. Adam vanished again and returned with another set of papers. He dropped those too, then joined them in the kitchen, taking the mail chest and starting to pick the lock. Barney was reading through all of the other information while Adam opened the chest. He handed it to Tara, who fished through the letters, all of which had already been opened earlier that day. She wanted to swear, but they all had to stay silent. She knew they should have moved sooner. She was going through the letters, not knowing what she was looking for, hardly recognizing anything, until one pale envelope caught her eye. It had the Selenian Eagle on it. Was this stolen intel as well? She took out the letter and was relieved to find it written in common. Top secret information for Riken General Taxon, commander of Fort Branset. Tara read it again, and could feel her eyes drying out in the cold air around her. For the Riken General... This was written for the commander of the fort by the Selenian government. She read the letter. There were names she didn't recognize, codes and whatnot. Then suddenly, in the middle of the page, the spymaster has dispatched a task force to destroy Fort Branset. No. No, no, no. The task force is composed of five dangerous and skilled humans who are to be captured and returned to the Selenian government for summary execution as war criminals. Tara could hear herself breathing. The page in front of her was shaking. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Adam looking concerned, but she couldn't look away from the page. The capture and execution of these individuals is paramount to the continued prosperity and profitability of the war effort. Tara was breathing faster now, and far too loudly. Adam grabbed the paper from her and put his hands on her shoulders. He was breathing fast too, in sync with Tara, and as his breathing slowed down, so did hers. She saw that Carson was reading the letter now, and his eyes were starting to widen. Tara noticed the quiet in the room. Hadn't the lizards been skittering? The door flew off its hinges as four Riken guards charged in. Adam had swung Tara behind him, intending to take the blow for her, but Siri smashed the door to pieces with her bare hands, the old wood crumbling like the walls and ceiling had. Carson had charged his shoulder into one of the guards and was trying to take his sword when more guards came in. The wall next to Barney exploded outward, and he called out for all of them to run. Adam bit at a guard holding Carson, and the two of them managed to break away from the group. Tara was reaching out to help Adam, but Siri had thrown her out of the smoldering wall. The air was sizzling with magical energy as she landed on the sand. She managed to stand up and was breathing heavily again, cold night air filling her lungs and fear filling her mind. She ran. She saw Barney ahead of her and tried to keep him in her line of sight. She could hear others behind her now, friend or foe she wasn't sure, but she couldn't look back now. The rest of the settlement seemed to wake up all at once, bells ringing and alarms sounding, people screaming and shouting. She heard arrows flying past her and she heard a scream behind her as Barney was preparing to blow through the next wall. Siri, she cried, finally looking back. Siri was running, an arrow stuck in her shoulder as she carried an injured Adam. Carson was behind her, his face half covered in blood. They were so far away. There was a blast in the night, a wave of heat as Barney took out the outer wall. Tara had stopped moving towards him. Siri's shoulder wasn't moving correctly, it might have been dislocated. Run! Siri screamed at her. Tara took a step back and kept running. Barney was still visible outside the smoking crater in the wall. He was running further into the desert. It was their only option. But the arrows were flying, and Tara could feel fire being shot past them. She tried to weave her path like a deer in the woods, but her lungs were burning, the adrenaline completely gone, her body exhausted. She would have to stop. She couldn't go. She would hold them off. Tara turned. She saw Siri try and tell her to run again, but she ignored her. 
She took as deep a breath as she could, her heart still pounding. The cold air rushed past her. Her outstretched fingers grew numb with the chill as she took control of the winds around her. She shaped them into a cyclone, a spiral of wind and force that only got stronger when Siri and Carson ran past her. She felt sand whipping her face, tiny cuts forming on her skin as the razor winds tore through the dunes and into the walls. Sand seemed to come between her and the fire and sound of the settlement. She saw guards charging her and watched them disappear in the sand as waves of it rushed over her. The sound was deafening. Wind and sand and yelling and pain as she threw a sandstorm between her and her enemies. Tara felt the air being sucked from her lungs. She let go and released the spell, but the storm raged without her. Tara looked around, seeing the walls of the cyclone still moving, wailing in the wind of the night. This was too strong. Something more than she had ever even imagined herself doing. Too strong to be any sort of natural storm set off by her efforts. There was a high-pitched laugh in the walls of sand, strong and cold as the wind that whipped around her. Tara spun in fear, seeing nothing but high walls of shifting sand closing in, coming closer to her. She tried to breathe, to find a way out, but there was only sand and wind, and then nothing. Her eyes felt crinkly when she opened them. She felt the oozing of blood from a hundred different wounds all over her body. She couldn't move. She thought she might have broken her neck before she tasted the poison in her mouth. She was paralyzed. No telling how long it would last. It was a testament to her resistance to plants that she could even move her eyes. I only want this one. I don't see a problem, an old voice said. She sounded like she was being bothered by a haggling salesman. They demanded all five. This was a dragonborn voice, a bit uncomfortable with the common tongue but managing well enough. It is out of my control. They're going to be executed anyway, the woman said, impatience in her voice like the syrup in Tara's mouth. Just say this one died in the storm. A storm which, may I remind you, the older woman continued, was responsible for the capture of the other four. Tara moved an eye as far as she could, and saw a strip of pink hair covered in sand. And this one is a druid, an omen of bad luck for everyone here. Do you want your men exposed to that? The dragonborn spoke to one of his companions. This deal will do, he said at last. Thank you, General, the woman said, the relief in her voice overshadowed by annoyance. The girl will die, I assure you. People started moving and Tara felt herself being lifted onto a hard wooden sled away from the others. She still couldn't move. She saw an ugly yellow hand with long, disgusting nails reach out and touch her face. Her head was moved to look into the face of the hag. This one had apparently given up on hiding her true form. Her yellow eyes were the only things not covered in a thick layer of sand. You're waking up already, little half-girl. The voice whispered, and Tara smelled foul breath. Interesting. Tara felt the hag enter her mind and put her to sleep. End of chapter.